Let's bring in our royal commentator here at CTV, Richard Berthelsen, for more on the implications. First off, Richard, I just got to get your reaction to this news. Well, it's a very sad day for the institution of the Governor General in Canada. It's a very sad day for the country as well to lose its de facto head of state. And of course, it's devastating for Julie Payette, as you say. You know, the Governor General has a critical constitutional role. And at a time of great uh, you know, stress in the country, the Governor General can play an extremely important role in terms of moral leadership and in terms of overall leadership. And I think uh, because of this report hanging over her for the last year largely, uh, that has not really been the case. And so this really was a day that, you know, in a lot of ways had to happen. Uh, it's sad that it has happened, but the report has really left everyone with no alternative. When you say had to happen, what do you mean? Well, I just don't think we can have a governor general who has these kind of allegations uh, swirling around her. It's, it's very difficult for organizations to uh, wish to be associated with the governor general. It's very difficult for, you know, average if, for Canadians to look up to this individual when these kind of allegations have been around. And we know they've been around uh, in, in, in pretty direct form for six months. And really, for the last two years of her term, really, there's been a lot of questions in the public sphere about her conduct in office. And Lisa raised a great point a moment ago, the idea that, you know, this sort of stuff is not tolerated anymore. It's not tolerated at any level. And so perhaps in the past, when you're talking about a very tough boss who, you know, reads employees, the riot act, so to speak, and people leave the office in tears, that kind of thing is, is no longer acceptable in, in 2021. Well, that's right. And, you know, the thing about Rideau Hall is the governor general is meant to kind of, you know, float above the day-to-day -day operations of the office. They shouldn't be in the position of, of, of dealing directly with staff in this kind of way when things go wrong. And, of course, it is not only the governor general that's implicated in this. It is the individual she selected personally as the secretary to the governor general, so the head of the establishment. And remember, this is an office of about 150 people. There's a great deal of pride. There's a great deal of excellence in terms of how people approach their work. I worked there myself for close to a decade. And the notion of staff, you know, kind of turning against the governor general is just anathemic to how people operate there. And I think what you're saying also, Todd, you know, we saw yesterday at the inauguration in the United States where, you know, in the afternoon, Joe Biden swore in his staff and he spoke specifically about how they were to treat each other and how they were to treat other people. This kind of behavior is completely unacceptable in the century that they're in. And, and for someone who is in the position of, you know, de facto head of state in this country, it is just not on. You are our royal commentator, so I've got to ask you what you think the reaction is going to be from Buckingham Palace, Richard? Well, you know, the palace, as you know, has already issued a statement today saying this is a matter for the Canadian government. It is the prime minister's responsibility to find a governor general, to select them, and to determine, you know, if there's difficulties. The prime minister does is meant to meet with the governor general and smooth out those sorts of things. I believe what is happening at the moment, and so while we haven't had a formal statement from the prime minister, is, you know, the Privy Council office and the prime minister's office is probably... In, in touch with the palace in London. Of course, we know the Queen's at Windsor Castle, but they're also five hours ahead of us. And so they would not want to make any precipitous announcement until the Queen was aware of it. They may also have to approach the Queen and ask her to terminate Julie's commission if, in fact, they wish uh, the, the Governor General to cease operating right away. So that is another aspect. The palace will also be interested in knowing what the Prime Minister's plan is to fill this. And I don't think they'll be expecting a candidate right away but, of course, the Queen will have to approve that name uh, in due course. So there's a number of activities that are going on in the, in the background. And, of course, the government will have to determine, as I say, whether or not this is going to have immediate effect, in which case the Queen has to terminate the commission, or whether the Chief Justice, as the principal deputy of the Governor General, is going to start to fill in. And, of course, that's extra work for him on top of his job. Based on your knowledge of Canadian history and, uh, you know, the Governor General and, and that role through the years, have we ever seen something like this before, Richard? Well, we have not in Canada. We have had a few Governors General who have not stayed the full five years. They've either left because they had another post that they were going to or their health was declining. So we have had people who've asked to be, uh, you know, leave early, earlier than the five years. Australia has had a few incidents where there has been conduct questions concerning the governor general, and they went through this process. And it was a very agonizing process where there was also a report 
And uh, the governor general in that case was terminated uh, by advice from the prime minister. A slightly different situation. It was conduct that that governor general had undertaken prior to being governor general. So this has happened throughout the Commonwealth. It is not a happy thing. The palace will be less than best pleased about it because the palace delegates the queen's functions to the governor general and is assuming that the governor general is operating in completely good faith in so doing. Does it do any damage, do you think, uh, to the image of the monarchy or the image of you know, the Queen's representative in Canada? I think it does do damage. Uh, it, has, it has been damaging over the last couple of years. I mean, this is why we're at this point. And it's, it's sad that this situation was allowed to continue to this point. Uh, you know, it has done extreme damage. A lot of people who are closely associated with the institution, either for working there or interacting with it or, or the kind of organizations that have a lot to do with the governor general over the course of the year, have certainly taken note of this over the years. And it has really strained relationships. The governor general has not been present in the sorts of activities that she may otherwise have been, particularly in this past year with the pandemic because of some of the issues around this. So it has been very damaging in terms of the uh, luster of the post, the uh, visibility of the post, the credibility of the post, and the character of the individual. And I think it certainly does raise questions for people about the arrangements. The fact is that once the report is uh, available and the prime minister has taken action, it is something that can be resolved very quickly in our system. It, it does not in take an impeachment or other types of things that we see like in our in the to the south, for example. But it is very, very damaging. And you know, at a time when the government is under such strain uh, because of the pandemic, it is extremely unfortunate that it's going to have to deal with this situation now. It strikes me as a journalist, Richard, that you know the governor general is never supposed to make headlines like this. They're never supposed to be uh, you know at the top of the news in a bad way. Uh, this is a ceremonial role. Uh, this is a role that, that has to do with, uh, you know, the Governor General performing that function, uh, part of our history and our tradition. And so you see this sort of situation where now the Governor General is breaking news. That's right. And the sad part about this, Todd, is there's absolutely no reason that this should not have been a successful appointment. As some of your previous guests have noted, Julie Pyatt was extremely well known to many Canadians. Many young people look up to her. Young women who are studying in sciences and engineering looked up to her. There's no reason that this should not have been successful. And she should have been able to find a way to work with staff and to work with the institution. Many people, you know, as I say, I've worked there myself. The institution is extremely flexible and works with different types of governor general in different ways. And it's, it's shocking the number of staff that have left over this particular incident uh, over the past few years. So, you know, it, it's really very, very hard to understand how this situation happened. And it's, it's very unfortunate that it did and that it took as long, time, as, long as it, it took to resolve. And I can tell you, for someone who is also in the position of secretary to the governor general, like Madame De Lorenzo, who is also resigning today, we're told, and I've been in that position myself in one of the provinces, I mean, your role is to keep a lid on things and to keep, you know, the political actors happy with how the office is operating, the public happy, and also the incumbent of the office. And that has been a complete failure in this case.